Welcome everyone to the Daily Growth Book chapter overview for Galatians chapter 6. Glad you're with us this week. I hope you've been enjoying the book of Galatians as much as I have. I have a newfound appreciation for this book after we've read it for the past few weeks. Want to look uh, first at the closing chapters here of this letter to the Galatians. Paul answers a question I'm sure many of the Galatians, like all of us, have been thinking throughout his entire letter. If we do not need to obey the law any longer, then how should we live? If we are throwing out this old guideline, then what should our new rule of living be? Paul's emphatic answer in chapter 5 has become one of the most beloved and well-cited passages in the Bible as he describes the distinction between a life that pursues the desires of the sinful nature and a life directed by the Spirit. He punctuates this chapter with a powerful image in Galatians 5, 24 through 25. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now Paul transitions to teaching us how Christians who live in the Spirit should treat each other using God's power. This is the start of chapter 6. It begins with an important instruction for the churches in Galatia. Throughout this letter, Paul has been pointing out that many, if not all, of the believers in this region have fallen away from the truth of God's Word. Now he addresses how we should help each other get back on track. Verse 1, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Now, first, when it comes to failure, we need to remember something really, really important. We can fall too. It's too easy for us to fall into the trap of believing that we're above that kind of thing. That when we see someone who's fallen into sexual sin or alcoholism or some other vice that we're disgusted by, we're beyond that. It's too easy to forget what it was like when we were struggling with some serious, besetting problem that we couldn't get past on our own. After so many years of walking with the Lord, it can be difficult to remember that if it was not for Jesus and His sacrifice, His desire to forgive, His ability to set us free, we'd still be stuck in a hole of our own making. So here Paul reminds us not to get prideful and to start thinking too highly of ourselves, like he says in Romans 12, 3. Paul takes the things a step further with a statement that again speaks directly to the heart of the controversy in the Galatian church. In verse 2, he says, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. What a great phrase. All throughout the past five chapters, by every means available to him, Paul has said the same thing over and over again. The law can never save you. Only Jesus Christ can save. Paul is speaking directly to those who love the Mosaic law and seek to make it the basis of faith. So what is this law of Christ that he's referencing? Well, let's look at Jesus' own words, the law of Jesus Christ, as he said it in John 13, 34 and 35. I give you a new law. That law is love each other as I have loved you, so you also love each other. This is how all people will know that you are my disciples. Powerful. He's saying you want to obey the law. Okay, here's the law you need to obey. Love people and care for them. Help them when they're down and out. In other words, show that you truly have faith in Christ by living as he commanded us to. Verse 3 If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourselves to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Now, I love this. I really love this. Paul is never one for mincing words. He just says it like it is. You're not too important to help someone. He tells us to be careful not to fall into that pride mentioned earlier and gives us some practical instruction on how to avoid pride altogether. Stop the comparisons. One of Satan's oldest tricks is to get us playing the comparison game. We look at the people all around us and try to use them as the measure of our own success. We make other people's failures our triumphs. 
Things like, thank God I didn't fall like they did. Thank God I'm still not trying to kick those cigarettes like so-and-so. I've been done with those for a long time. Thank God I don't cuss and talk like that anymore. Thank God I'm not a sinner like them. Paul is saying that all of us, no matter how long we've been walking with God or how far away our last royal failure was, we need to remember that we're no better than anyone else. Every one of us, regardless of what our struggle was or is today, need Jesus to save us. When we start looking around and saying, well, at least I'm not as bad off as them, or thankfully I'm a little better off than those people, we've lost perspective and are only fooling ourselves. There will be a day when we stand before Jesus to give an account for our lives. And I love that Paul reminds us of this. This is where I think the legalists get a little lost. What? I thought you said we were free to live as we pleased. I thought you said we don't need to obey rules anymore. This is not at all what Paul has been saying. Rather, he is saying you don't have to obey any set of rules to be saved. You don't have to live by the requirements of the Old Testament law in order to be saved. However, your life will be judged by a much higher standard, the law of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. The Amplified Version says, For we believers will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. This moment where we are held responsible for our conduct is not the great white throne of judgment that's described in Revelations 20. That's where the saved are divided from the damned based solely on whether their name is written in the book of life. Your name is written in that book simply by believing and receiving Jesus. There's another moment we're called upon to give an account for how we lived our lives before Christ, and comparisons to our neighbor will not matter on that day. Let me carry on just for the sake of time. Let's go to verse 6. It says, Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Here Paul makes one final appeal to us to care for one another but this time specifically addressing teachers. He says that we should take care of our teachers and provide for them. Now on this read through, I was amazed to see this connection between caring for our teachers of the word and the law of sowing and reaping, which it talks about in verse seven. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Before Paul really jumps into the topic of harvesting what we plant, it almost seems he just randomly drops in this statement about caring for our teachers, but it's not random at all. First, Paul is reminding the Galatians of just how important it is to find and keep close teachers of the word of God, not people who preach their own opinions like the legalist had been doing. Second, he's making it clear that supporting our teachers isn't a waste, but an investment like planting seeds. In other words, sharing in all the good things isn't just good for the teacher. It's good for the one who is taught and shares because we'll get a return on what we invest. Next, Paul takes us to a bigger picture of this principle of sowing and reaping. It's not just about giving and supporting teachers and ministers. It applies to our lives as a whole as well. Verse 8 says, Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Now, the applications of this verse are endless, but I'll limit myself to two major takeaways. One, if we feed our flesh, we get more of the flesh. If we feed our spirit, we get more of the spirit. Many people find it impossible to change, to break the habits in their life that they know are ripping them off and leaving them broken, depressed, or feeling like a failure. Here, Paul gives us a truly life-changing truth. If you want to change the output, you need to change the input. What we put into our minds and our hearts will come out. That's what it talks about in Matthew 12, 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Are you struggling with adultery or some other form of sexual morality? What kind of movies are you watching? Are they full of sensuality, adultery, and aimed at arousing your flesh? Are you struggling with food addiction or weight loss? Maybe you need to stop binge watching The Great British Baking Show. Are you struggling with anger, impatience, walking around with a chip on your shoulder? Maybe it's time to stop listening to all that hardcore gangster rap. 
or to cut out some of the time with your boys from the construction site who seem to be trying to set a world record for the number of F words they can get into one sentence. The bottom line, garbage in equals garbage out. Number two, what we sow multiplies. A farmer reaps what he sows, but not exactly. A farmer who plants one apple seed doesn't simply get an apple seed back. He gets an apple tree. That one seed doesn't simply turn into another seed, nor does it simply produce an apple, which is filled with seeds. It produces a tree that produces dozens, if not hundreds of apples over time, all filled with seed. What am I saying? A sin doesn't just lead to another sin. It leads to death and decay and possibly eternal separation from God. An investment in our spirit or doing what we know is right and pleases God doesn't just lead to a good feeling or a pat on the back. It leads to everlasting life, a life that we long to live in close and intimate friendship with God. Finally, Paul concludes his thoughts on sowing and reaping by again returning to an admonition to utilize our resources well by caring for one another. Verse 9 says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Final thoughts from Paul, verse 11. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Now, this verse kind of stands out. Just a quick point to make about it. At this point in history, it was common to dictate letters to a secretary. Paul did this often himself, but he would often personally write a short portion at the end to authenticate the letter and to add a personal touch. He does that in 1 Corinthians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians as well. Looking at verse 12, those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. Now, it's interesting to think of the motives of those who wanted to compel the Galatians to be circumcised. At the time Paul's writing, the entire world is under Roman control. The Romans recognized Judaism as a legitimate religion. So there may have been some who simply wanted to keep hidden from Roman persecution by keeping Christianity as just another sect of Judaism. There's also the very real concern of being dishonored and looked down upon by the Jews themselves. Any Jew who embraced Christianity, relying upon Christ alone for salvation, would have been automatically excommunicated from the synagogue and very likely disowned from their very own family. It wouldn't just jeopardize their social circles either, but also their very livelihoods, as former friends and colleagues might be forced or feel compelled to boycott them or their businesses. Finally, there's the concern that so many even today face— The idea that we aren't justified by what we do, that all that matters is what Christ has done, is deeply offensive to our human nature. You mean I can't save myself? Yes, you need a savior just like the rest of us. You mean my salvation depends on this relatively obscure carpenter's son from a backwater village being executed on a cross? Yes, If you will not accept his death as your own, you have no answer for your sins. So you're telling me that there's nothing I can do to be saved? That's right. You can't do anything but this. Believe in Jesus Christ and accept that he truly died for your sins. Then you will be saved. I can imagine even the most staunch supporter of Jesus saying something like we hear today, but we can't simply do whatever we please. We have to do something. We have to have some rule for the way we live our lives. This is foolishness. And in order to avoid that foolishness, these men sought to make the law our standard for salvation, even though they themselves could not keep it. As Paul says in verse 13, even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. There's a lot of men at this time in history who are going around boasting about how many Gentiles they've converted, how many Gentiles they got to go get circumcised. And Paul's saying that is a joke. 14, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. Here's the crux of this chapter. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Again, Paul bringing us to this really important, 
powerful, impressive, unchanging truth that God's work in us is more important than any work we do, that Christ's work on the cross is all the work that matters. And we can strive to obey laws thinking that will save us, but it will never save us because only what Jesus has done will save us. But there is a law that will begin to work inside of us. It's the law of Christ that the Holy Spirit empowers and imparts within us that gives us a desire to love those around us, to care for the people who surround us, our family, our friends, our church. And that's the law by which we now live. In closing, I love Paul's closings, but verse 16, may God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. If I could take a moment just to talk about these scars, he's not talking about stigmata, the idea that you might have some scars that appear on your body that mimic or resemble the scars that Jesus has on the cross. He's talking about uh, something completely different. In that time, in this era of history, it was very common for a slave to be branded by his master. It was also common for soldiers who loved and cared greatly for their generals who felt great pride in them to take a mark of their general on their body. And so either of those marks might be what Paul's referring to. But another thing that I know he is referring to is his resume from 2 Corinthians. He talks about all that he's gone through to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus and how Jesus can save. He's been shipwrecked. He's been whipped. He's been beaten. He's been imprisoned. He's been stoned to death. And all those things have left a mark on his body. And so here's Paul saying, guys, I don't care about how many people I've gotten circumcised. I don't care about how many people I've convinced to live by the Mosaic law. I care about how many have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and I'm willing to pay the price, and my body proves it. And that's what Paul wants to remember as we go out. It's not about anything other than the work of Jesus Christ. And finally, he closes with the the, the main word of this book, which is grace. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace, that's the unmerited favor of God, the unmerited favor of Jesus Christ, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. What a powerful letter. What an incredible book that we got to study that makes it clear there's nothing that we can do but believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's where our salvation comes from, from His work on the cross. I hope you've enjoyed Galatians. I certainly have, and we're looking forward to diving into the first book of Thessalonians next week. Can't wait to see you there. 